Um, let's uh, let's kick this off. Yeah. So um, I guess I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Declan Rankin Jarden. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Alvea. Uh, my background's in beekeeping and uh, also operations. So mostly working on service delivery and engagement, a bit of finance too. And I've uh, basically been working uh, for the last uh, 11 odd years as a partner to the CRE market. And um, quick blurb about Alvea. Um, our goal is really to plug nature into commercial real estate. And so we've been um, installing pollinator habitats, uh, facilitating nature education for tenants at a property level um, for the last decade. And um, yeah, as you can see here, we, we operate in the US and Canada um, and parts of Europe, and we are really f exclusively focused on urban environments. Um, and so also, quick uh, quick fun fact, I'm, I'm here in uh, Cali, Colombia for uh, COP16. I'm um, trying to stay tuned to kind of the evolving global biodiversity policies. And um, Alveol is trying to be well positioned to help uh, CRE navigate the wave of kind of upcoming trends and initiatives around biodiversity. And so uh, that's why I'm here. And um, yeah, the reason I'm so excited to have our two guests here today um, is because I'm personally a pretty big believer in uh, building certifications. I think they're one of the best ways to kind of showcase all the miniature, sometimes imperceptible, overlooked sustainability initiatives. Um, and uh, yeah, I think setting the tone for the industry on where the bar is and, and, and you know, being thought leaders is, is something um, that uh, a market always needs and, and uh, showing a clear path on, you know, where to innovate, where to improve, I think is really fun. Um, so yeah, I have two kind of core members of the U.S. Green Buildings Council with me. I'm ben uh, Stapleton, who's executive director of the U.S. GBC in California, and Colin Mangum, who's director of corporate sustainability and innovation as well. Um, so welcome to both of you. I will uh, quickly go over the agenda for the webinar so we can, uh, and then we can uh, kind of get cooking. Um, yeah, the way I see it, over the course of the half hour, we're going to start with uh, getting to know the US GBC, uh, particularly around some of the work being done in California. And then we're going to smoothly kind of zoom out to more general topics around sustainable infrastructure, uh, the innovation happening there, and uh, hopefully get, um, you know, the Collins kind of specialty around biomimicry, which I, I really find in, um, enjoyable. And, and we can probably end on some of the positive impacts um, I hope that are happening in CRE around biodiversity, which uh, obviously is my favorite subject at the moment. Um, so starting local and then finishing up with future trends um, that you're both seeing. All right, um, sounds good. Let's, uh, to that point, Ben, um, could you give us kind of a quick overview of, you know, the ongoing work you're doing at the US uh, Green Buildings Council in California? Uh, sure. And thank you for, for having us to climb. We've always enjoyed working with, with you and the team. Um, big believers in nature-based solutions overall here. And, and I'm excited to always, always enjoy Colin's biomimicry presentation, which he has many varieties and flavors of. Uh, he could probably spend the better part of, of this week going through that presentation if, if you had the time. Um, it's diverse, Ben. It's diverse. Just like nature. Just like nature, Colin. So hello, my name is Ben Stapleton. I'm the executive director here at the U.S. Green Building Council of California. Uh, we are an independent nonprofit, so I always like to say for California, by California. Uh, our mission is really to leverage the built environment as an entry point to help make California a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable place for all. Uh, we do that through direct community engagement and education. Uh, we have a portfolio of 15 programs that we run uh, throughout California focused on workforce development. Uh, direct work in low-income housing, both single-family, multifamily. Uh, we do a bunch of work on innovation, and uh, we work with startups. Uh, Colin's going to talk about some of that that work here uh, a little bit later. Uh, and you know, all this is really to lift people up. You know, no matter where they are, to have agency and and be able to use the environment around them to create positive change in the world. Um, you know, I, I feel like this always shocks people a little bit when I say this, but uh, any green building certification plays a role in the market in providing a structure and a process for people to look at how do they approach buildings. Uh, LEED is is one of those. Um, you know, uh, we help promote, you know, LEED uh, as, a, as a certification and, and, and LEED related education, LEED buildings here across California. 
uh, LEAD, which is Leadership in Environmental Engineering and Design. Uh, it's always great to kind of break down the acronyms, uh, is the globally leading certification, not just around green buildings, but I would say, I would argue as a, as a green building nerd, uh, uh, around sustainability in general, and really has led the movement. If you look a lot of what you know, ESG is pushing on today, a lot of that's been built on a lot of the best practices and approaches that we've created in the green building industry for years. Um, and I actually was able to share some time with David Godfrey, uh, who's the the founder of USGBC and the World Green Building Council. In fact, over the last year, uh, we've developed a better relationship. I spend uh, time with him every couple of weeks or so. And one of the things he said, we had a big launch party for our Bay Area community last Thursday, is that uh, I think there's 78 green building councils around the world now, including ours now here in California. Uh, and that's really because people are people are the same who are in our community, whether they're here, whether they're in Colombia, uh, even Canadians, Taklan, even even Canadians. Uh, in that uh, we're all we're all a group of misfits and nerds who uh, really believe in the power of our work to help make the world a better place, and and that's what brings us together and and. Uh, that's really, you know, here in, at USGBC California, uh, we're here to welcome all those people in and figure out how we work together to make that change happen. So that's my statement and I'm sticking to it for what it's worth. Oh, <laughs> Amazing. So, I covered all of this. I covered all of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can go to the next slide. Actually, that's, that's fine. Um, so I don't know if they're, they're advancing. Dun, 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 dun. Next slide. Oh, perfect. Um, one of the things that I'll frame just around the work we do, which I think is important, uh, is you know California has been a global leader in the fight against climate change. You know, a lot of people don't don't know this, but California is the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, we have the largest manufacturing base in the U.S., the largest agricultural base in the U.S., the largest logistics hub in the U.S. We have Hollywood, we have Silicon Valley, um, and obviously because I'm a Californian, all I care about is myself. But uh, I really believe California is, is uh, sort of a microcosm of the world. One of my favorite things about our state is that we have the largest population outside of their home country of over 65 different ethnicities. And uh, we experience issues around flooding, extreme heat, air quality, water scarcity. These are issues that people experience all around the world. Uh, but I actually believe that we have the opportunity to solve a lot of those challenges in California because we have tend, tend to have pretty good political alignment, may not seem that way all the time. Uh, we have the capital, both intellectual, uh, and and people, uh, but also financial to help make that change. And so I've really been pushing and urging our community that not only do we have this opportunity to help solve a lot of these challenges, but we actually have the responsibility to solve those. And, and with as diverse of a community as we have here across the state, then we can hopefully export those solutions out to the rest of the world. So next slide, please. Uh, and so our mission here, I've already covered some of that, but uh, you'll notice that the leading, educating, connecting, advocating uh, those are all action-oriented words, and so we're really focused on the action. Uh, I know we're here on a webinar today. Uh, I always say it's about what happens between the events. Uh, events are important. They play a role to educate, inspire, connect people, some of the other words you see here. Uh, but events themselves are not getting the work done, right? I mean, it's all about what happens be between those events. And so I think here in the in the climate community, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great that we're out and connecting with each other and being inspired. And uh, now, now we need to continue to dig in and figure out how we, we translate that to action. So next slide, please. Um, one thing I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't mention is that we're having our big annual conference, the California Green Building Conference, uh, next May uh, at Fort Mason in San Francisco. Uh, the last couple of years, we've had about 1,500 attendees. We've had in L.A. Uh, for me, I, my vision is this is like a green building nerd festival. Uh, so we have, you know, we have art, we have music, we have bees. Uh, we have a bunch of technology solutions, uh, and you're able to learn from people, connect with things, have a great time, and uh, be inspired to move everything forward. So I hope folks can make it out. And with that, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Colin Mangum, who's our Director for Corporate Sustainability and Innovation, and an old-school biomimicry nerd at heart. So over to you, Colin. Aren't, aren't we all, though, Ben? Well, I mean, the basis of who we are as human beings, it's probably true, yeah. And that and that's our webinar, folks. <laughs> uh, so uh, just just quickly, this is mainly for framing of of 
not, not only what I do, but mainly what will inform what I talk about, particularly in, in this webinar, uh, what I do for corporate sustainability and innovations is largely we work with the, with the large corporations, the, the household names, the big brands, which I've spent a lot of time with in my career. Uh, even Fortune 50, et cetera, but also the the smaller companies, the the one and two and, and five and 10 person companies that are actually making the impacts, maxing their credit cards to really focus on whatever that solution is out on the front lines, literally leading edge, bleeding edge that the larger corporations aren't seeing. And then we, we sometimes mix those two together because as we know how the world works, a lot of the larger animals will actually work with the smaller animals and uh, and help them to evolve and survive and thrive. And so that's, we, we do connect, we'll help the larger corporations um, you know, meet their targets for sustainability, ESG, uh, everything green, but at the same time, we're actually advocating and leveraging our community, as been mentioned, uh, to look at its like untapped resources of a lot of different thought leaders and impact makers and real estate owners that can help these young companies have a place to actually, you know, present their solution, Im implement their solutions, and then gain the strength, gain the validation, gain the the proof of concept and, and metrics, et cetera, to be able to then scale their adoption. And that's a lot of what we do between the large and the small. Uh, we also, I just want to. International Gateway just really quickly because it's a lot of what we do here is you know representing California as well, which is we we look at market entry. We're trying to bring solutions into the state, but at the same time, we are recognized as leaders and innovators in the space, especially around green building and sustain sustainability, that we're effectively exporting that thought leadership as best we can. Um, and so that's a lot of what we do internationally, but it's also what we do domestically. And so then I'll jump forward actually to the Net Zero Accelerator. And if you could go to the next slide, please. I just want to, uh, if you go back to 90 alumni companies, the previous slide, the, what you know, it's probably hard to see on your screen there, but we've worked with now over 100 companies, including what I'll show you on the next slide. But what I want to focus in on here is really like advanced materials and occupant health you see there on the left hand side, because there are nature based solutions in both those areas, adept materials. Um, See, even even I'm trying to read them. Hemotexture, rhizome. These are we have a couple of companies that are leveraging bamboo materials. One that's actually you know utilizing uh, different uh, tree structures uh, from willow trees to actually create highway barriers in a more organic way. Uh, adept materials, fantastic. They're actually looking into nature. This is biomimicry and saying how to how to like leaves, for example, uh, use hydrophobic and lo water loving and hydro you know hydro phobic meaning water, you know, repelling and hydrophilic water loving uh, properties to regulate the temperature and humidity in a, in, a, in, a, in a built environment, in a space, just by how the paint is applied and how it's layered, which is utterly fantastic. Uh, so we, we work with a lot of nature-based, uh, you know, companies. And if you go to the next side, um, what, what you'll see here is we actually have two uh, in this current cohort that are working like hemp building is using hemp wool for building material. But also it's interesting because this is the first year ever that we've we've had a company called Grow Oyster Reefs, which was recently a Trailblazer Award winner at the at the uh, Net Zero Conference here in Anaheim. And you could probably guess by their names what they do, but this is really the first time we've gone directly out of the built environment and the infrastructure it serves to look at where what is another type of built environment that in, in effect serves our communities in terms of decarbonizing and occupant health and, and actually, in this case, coastal restoration and resilience, which is important for all the coastline of California. So we're expanding into other opportunities of different types of built environments. And that's an example, very much a nature-based solution. And next slide, please. So uh, where is he going to go with this one? Um, <laughs> So I, I often present a beaver uh, because beavers are keystone species. And if you go to the next slide, what, what you'll see is, of course, you know, beavers in creating their habitat and damming up these these waters, they create habitats for others to survive and, and thrive. Now, do they know it? We don't know. Uh, but but if you create your home as a keystone species to create, you know, habitat for others, that's a wonderful thing. And that's what we do. Uh, and sometimes our environment, if you go to the next slide, doesn't exactly look like this. It looks like this for us, uh, Ben and here, uh, here in Los Angeles. So that's a little bit different. And we have a lot of different neighboring species here. But I think this will bring us to our next topic on, you know, the importance of green building. Uh, but I want to mention in, in all of that, you know, I've, I've been in the biomimicry circles for a while. And, and there are 
there are some people that would would say, you know, kind of shame humanity, like nature knows best, which I don't disagree with. But like bad humans, look at what you've done. You've you bulldozed all this nature to create your your ugly buildings and that type of thing. And, and the way we see it, and I know Ben is aligned with this, we'll speak more to this as we go along. It's like, OK, well, you know, humans are also biological. Humans are also nature based solutions. Spoiler alert. Uh, but I don't see the built environment as, you know, necessarily a terrible thing. At least, look, we've got it. Uh, let's let's leverage it. Let's let's leverage it for occupant health. Let's leverage it for improving biodiversity. Uh, and let's get into this conversation around why it's important, because it's here. It's how we shelter ourselves. It's how we how we, you know, in, improve the the resilience of, of our own species. It's how we do things. So let's let's embrace that. But let's do things better. Let's work with the active building stock we have here. Uh, that's more about how we'll talk about sustainability. But with that, I think, Deck, I'll go back over. Says on screen. Wow, thanks, Colin. That was you really managed to to compress all all those uh, thoughts. Um, yeah, and, and I I can't help but agree. Like like I think um, nature based solutions is really just calling out the fact that um, we're trying to work with nature, whereas opposed to you know not working with it or, or trying to kind of go around nature. We're, we're just saying let's let's bring it into the fold of of what we're up to, and so. Um, yeah, to that point, like, like, um, are you seeing any kind of um, interesting, specific nature-based solutions, particularly in Cal California or potentially elsewhere around the world? It seems like you have a pretty, through the NZA, um, you have a pretty good connection to what's kind of going on in the world. Uh, do you have any kind of interesting examples to share? Yeah, well I, well, I think one thing to say to go into this is also let's, let's talk about what what nature based solutions are and and what you mentioned is like you know you know how can we help nature and in a lot of cases it's like you know how do how can we you know get out of the way of nature nature will do just fine it's just will it do just fine on our our behalf one of the things we talk about nature based solutions and certainly in biomimicry is that you know nature runs on information and a lot of that is in feedback loops you know and so uh, a lot of that is not audible it's not it's not communications in the form that that we typically think of like for example there's the as susan samard said the the wood wide web like what's going on beneath the soil there's communication going on can't necessarily hear it but trees are communicating through mycorrhiza fungi you know there's there's in in the way they do it is an exchange of resources right and i mentioned that because sometimes we just need to get out of the way. But the thing that we're seeing with nature-based solutions is an increasing uh, understanding that with biodiversity, and there's been a lot of biodiversity loss, and I know that, that you're certainly focused on this, you know, if we don't have the biodiversity, we we go away. We need the biodiversity. Uh, we we are nature, right? And I believe, and I'll misquote Einstein, but if the bees go away, uh, you know, he said man, quote unquote, would go away in like four years or some some time frame like that. So without our pollinators uh, that provide ecosystem services, we all go away. And so there, the nature-based solutions for us, a lot of it we see in just increasing green space. We see it at lo largely in actually bio-utilization of using plants, uh, not only for, you know, healthier environments in terms of the like air quality and those types of things, also bioremediation, as we see, like there are contaminated sites, for example, in, uh, I'll just mention like South LA, underserved, underserved, economically disadvantaged communities where like an entire city block has been chain linked off for the better part of 20 years because no one will step up and say, all right, well, there's been industrial use there that's contaminated the soil and let's do something about it. Now that we're starting to do those, those things, but had we planted things there that could volatilize, meaning, you know, plants can take the, the contaminants and get them into the air in a safe way or hold them in place, or we can use worms and fungi and, and other organisms to actually, you know, remediate that site. We could actually not only use nature a nature-based solution which is actually basing the nature in the solution actually utilizing nature but we also then create what we call biophilic design which is inherently humans just want to see nature want to be near nature love to be you know just like to see organic forms in our world and so maybe i'll stop there because a lot of 
A lot of what we want to do is actually not just the nature doing the work on our behalf, but also us living in an environment that feels better to us, that that is more naturally, you know, uh, in, indicative of what we are as a species. We want to be in natural environments. And maybe I'll just I'll just take a breath uh, there and, and see what the yeah, it's like. Like to that to that point, um, maybe it's a, an interesting segue to just add the idea of, of cost. Like it, it does seem that when when you're thinking about doing, you know, having ESG goals, trying to create an, a healthier building or a healthier environment, uh, people th just kind of come to the gut reaction that it's going to cost more. But it sounds like what you're hinting at is is with a bit of foresight and and just, you know, looking at a project holistically, you can actually potentially, you know, install, let's say, a tree that's going to do the work for you. Or, or There's a lot of things there that um, you just have to take a bit more of a long-term frame of mind and... Uh, it can actually end up being simpler. Yeah, well, the long-term frame of mind is is key to everything you just said, uh, which is because you know we we're so we've been trained by our iPhones, etc., and our and our stock markets to really want near-term gains, near-term gains, and so our our long-term views have gotten really distorted uh, and out of whack, in my opinion. And I'm not going to speak against capitalism or any of these types of things we we might do in these types of conversations. Uh, you know, I, I believe that there's a power in the system, but the long term is important because we're so short-term oriented that we can't see that nature works on different time scales. We have to be planting the trees that we may never see. You know. Uh, in our lifetime, you know, fully developed or, or harvested or whatever those things are like. So you have to, you know, what, what's the saying? The, the time to plant a tree was either 20 years ago or or now there's and I'm really I'm, I'm messing up this quote. Maybe Ben has a better version of it. Um, but the, the long term timescales would actually works against us, not only in the return on investment that people want from these things. So that gets in the costing of it, but also like how much time is it going to take for those plants to remediate that site that could take years? Yeah, maybe we should have started previously, but, you know, let's still at least do it where we can do it. And planting plants and and introducing bees in ecosystems, uh, introducing, for example, it was with a friend yesterday talking about introducing beavers into uh, ecosystems where they're trying to to reduce soil degradation uh, by certain streams because you dam, dam this up, beaver goes out, does the work, vegetation increase. And what they found out was, oh, wow, we're seeing an explosion in salamander populations. And a lot of salamanders are actually, you know, they're they're on the bubble for going extinct. And like, wow, there's a there's an externality, as we say, there's a beautiful byproduct of actually doing, we said we want to reduce the soil degradation, um, but at the same time, something else wonderful happened. And again, I'll, I'll stop there because I, I, we have, we don't have four or five hours for this, I know, but I'd love to have it. <laughs> Yeah, if I, or, if I or maybe I add add something to what you said, Colin. I think that the reality is is that uh, you know our understanding of nature is is far from perfect, right? At this point, and you know most of what we bring to the table are all assumptions, right, and models for how we think things work. And I think we have numerous examples over time where we figure out at some point, oh, actually that wasn't accurate. We're actually our financial model for how we evaluate buildings and how we make these decisions is actually flawed and. We've been doing all these things for decades based on a model that, that really wasn't reflecting a, uh, a perfect picture of what the world is. And, and so uh, nature has figured a lot of that out over a much longer time scale, as we discussed. Right? Yeah, nature has figured us out more than we know, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, In so terms of um, maybe you can speak to this, um, then like market adoption, how do, how do you see um, just more generally, potentially in California, how how uh, biophilic design and, and nature-based solutions are, are coming? Is there like, um, where are we in the like phase of early adopters to kind of, uh, do you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I I think, you know, this, this nature-based solutions, I think is on its way to becoming more mainstream, if that makes sense, right? I think part of it is as people look at, at ESG, if we're still allowed to say that acronym, I know in some places we're not, uh, you know, people really struggle to define the S, right? What is What are these social benefits? What does that look like? Uh, a lot of that has turned into things that could be, you know, nature-based type solutions that are benefiting people and the environment around around their, their projects. Um, and I think we see great returns, right, in, in nature-based solutions that we're just starting to understand, whether that's, you know, looking at, at carbon credits or, or, or ways that we can, you know, use offsets. You know, people are, are finding ways to create projects that are nature-based solutions 
that they're trying to tag value to. So, you know, more and more, I think this is becoming a big thing. And and the other thing I think is that we're starting to realize more of the, the co-benefits, which this, this, you know, wheel here speaks too well of why nature-based solutions are so important, right? Because it's not just that we're tackling one thing, it's that everything's connected. And, you know, I'll use as an example, uh, just, you know, landscape when we're doing landscape retrofits, you know, the, the value of using native plants, it's not just about, hey, these plants are better adapted to the environment, may use less water. That's a great reason and goal, but they're also more fire resistant. They also support the biodiversity locally. And that biodiversity, even if you just do it at one home and then uh, a block and then a community uh, has all these other benefits that reinforce the environment that we just don't understand as simple human beings. And so um, the, re the more we lean into nature as a solution, the better off we're going to be long term. It's a, it's a great example, Ben, of like wildfire defense. And certainly that's a local challenge we have here. Nature really is nature's one of nature's principles is being locally attuned, but like home hardening, right? By, uh, you know, planting native plants is great for wildfire defense. And I think also um, I'll just make one more point uh, back to deck, what you mentioned about costs, like a, a green roof, for example, where you might actually have pollinators that can reduce, you know, the, 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 um, the load on electricity for HVAC by like 30%. So your costs can be greatly uh, reduced by the, by as, as a function of the things that it actually reduces in other areas. So it may cost this to do that on top of that roof uh, to, to, you know, you have to put in some extra support for the roof and there's, you know, certainly there's, there's water management, et cetera, but ultimately the cost of reducing the, the energy load on the building is what we look at. Yeah. And it seems like tenants um, are becoming a little more aware of these things and, and requesting them too. So it, so it, it and um, yeah, so it, it sounds uh, sounds really positive. I I I'm not surprised here. It's already twelve thirty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we sped through that. Um, do you have uh, do do you guys want to sum up, or, or are there any things we potentially didn't hit before we start taking a couple of questions? Uh, I would just say that we're still. I think at hopefully right at the beginning of this journey i you know i'd say we don't have all this figured out but i think uh using a business approach to better promote and scale nature-based solutions like you're doing at aviola is is incredibly important um and that'll help us continue to make the business case you know that whether we like it or not we live in a capitalistic society most of us i know there may be people here from other places and we need to leverage that framework to move things forward that requires us shifting the framework, right? That requires us uh, tagging monetary value to what some of these things are so that we can shift the system. So I would just encourage people to continue to lean into that and figure out how do we actually pitch and talk about the ROI of these solutions. I think something that hit the hurt the green building movement for so long is that we kept saying this was the right thing to do. That's great. We all know it's the right thing to do, but unless the hard work is doing, making the business case as to why, and that's where we should be spending our time because that'll help things scale faster and faster. Amazing. Um, well, I wanted to touch on on one little thing. I don't know um, if we, if I think it's, it's kind of relevant. I've, I've been curious to know if you have any insights on lead version five, if there's, there's anything uh, you're hearing. I, I know it's in kind of the process. Uh, not sure when it's going to be ready, but, but uh, I'd love to hear you guys uh, Talk a little and, bit about that. You know, lead version five, you know, would, had a large time period of public comment this year. Um, you know, I think the intent is that a lot of those comments are wrapped into an updated version of lead version five as we head into next year. And there'll be a pilot phase of that before things are finalized. I think there's a couple of good things in this. Um, lead version five is doing a much better job of taking into account everything that's changed in the, in the green building world since lead version four was there, whether that's embodied carbon, nature-based solutions, how are we addressing electrification and working all that stuff into, you know, more of a performance-based approach for, for how buildings are, are, are ranked and monitored. So uh, I think those are all positive things. The other thing that I think is a really important item is that USGBC is committed to updating lead, you know, on a, on a regular cycle. Um, and that provides some, 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 you know, really knowledge in the market and confidence uh, of what's going to happen when. So um, I think those are some important things to touch on.
And Ben, isn't there, there's more of a focus this time around with lead five on occupant health and, and actually nature-based solutions are a little more aligned with what we'd seen previously with LFI and LBC and those types of things, right? That's right. That's right. And, and that's important. I mean, you know, uh, especially if we talk about buildings, you know, buildings only exist because of people, right? And and unless we're taking care of the people that are in them, you know, what's 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 the point, right? So um, I think that's really important to note. And I, I see a question here from Dylan in the chat uh, on that point of calculating ROI for these solutions. Uh, what are you seeing as ways of doing so if you're not directly influencing energy? There's so many other ways to, to calculate this that all tie back to money. And they, that comes back to people. Uh, I think we really need to be looking at, you know, how are we measuring productivity? How are we measuring impacts to, to health, whether those are sick days, uh, lower levels of productivity, um, that could be medical costs, things like that. Um, those are all returns on investment. And we know that having access to nature, uh, being around animals and insects and natural light and better air quality, those things improve productivity. And that has been measured. Those things reduce sick days. And that has been measured. Uh, and those things create a, an ROI. You know, people focus so much on uh, the rental rate they may pay for the space or how much they're paying uh, on a per square foot basis for, for energy. The Typically, the amount of money they're spending on their people in that space is 100 times at least that amount. Uh, and so that's where the focus really needs to be is, is how are we how are we better supporting those people getting more productive productivity out of those people and so hopefully that's that's helpful Dylan. okay I, there's another question earlier around um uh, from john payne i went to a usgb council meeting meet up in chicago about a year and a half ago and they mentioned that the companies could no longer get lead points for adopted for nature-based solutions like setting up beehives on a green roof is that still the case as far as I know, I think you can get innovation credits for those types of solutions. Um, so, uh, you know, I I think you can still get those. And uh, you guys probably filed for some of those at Alveoli, I would imagine. And then I think that will be better addressed in lead, lead version five. Yeah. Yeah. And I can confirm we, there's definitely points associated to beehives and pollinators. And yeah, yeah. that kind of habitat. Okay. Um, those are our two questions. Um, there's nothing else, then we, we can maybe leave it here. Um, Colin, do you have any other thoughts or emerging trends that you'd uh, care to share? Anything uh, you're seeing down the pipe? Well, I, I think if we're, if we're going to wrap it up a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the macro. Um, one thing that I know and what I love about our work here and what I've what I've loved with my work, even the biomimicry community, biomimicry 3.8, the Institute, et cetera, is just how aligned everyone is as a community on, as Ben said earlier, we, we know this is the right thing to do. It makes my day-to-day -day so wonderful to not have to convince too many people like this is the right thing to do. I'm working with people, everybody, everybody on our team here uh is like of course um, why we we don't need don't even need to talk about that it really it, it accelerates everything you want to do in your day and it just really makes it nice however where we don't always align across the community of of especially nonprofits that are all you know you know grasping for different you know sometimes the same resources is how to go about it how to prioritize it and so what i'm seeing though as an emerging trend is is biophilic design, for example, and understanding that it's not just bioutilization, but it's also just incorporating like organic structures into architecture. And we work a lot with the AEC community of architecture, architects, engineers, and, and construction companies. And so how are we actually engineering? How are we actually architecting things in our forms that actually have function? N nature, you know, of uh, form follows function, right? And so, and, and architecture follows nature and you can get really rabbit hole into this in the best of ways and into the Warren. Uh, but what I what I do like seeing is increasingly, and back to, to Ben's, you know, point about just like, you know, uh, let's say cognitive performance in, in in the built environment, like occupant health in terms of like just being healthier, not only just just you know physically, but mentally, emotionally, etc. You know what we're seeing is like organic forms inside of our our buildings, uh, not just green walls and those types of things. Like even like a, how a staircase is formed, or how you know an office environment has uh, a flow a flow to it, a fluidity to it. We're now really thinking about 
uh, that human empathy. And we see that with human-centered design based with nature-based solutions. Now we're seeing that kind of that, that confluence of those two types of things really beginning to be a trend. And so I'm loving the trend of biophilic design. And I'll give you one example I happen to love, which is there's a sense of peril. I mentioned staircases, for example, but how a staircase might be uh, formed so that you so it looks like it's not really doesn't have the tip to the conventional underpinnings of it. Uh, it's got may, maybe looks like it's kind of cantilevered and floating in mid midair. Somewhere in your mind, you may not be thinking about it, but somewhere deep in your in your subconscious, it's there's a sense of peril. Like, does is this actually sturdy? Is this actually safe? And just escalating, just just walking that staircase up to your office, let's say. Or, or into your home, uh, back in your mind somewhere, there's something telling you to be more alert. And so it's like cognitive function and mental acuity and these types of things. There, there's an effect of these things that can happen for biophilic design. And I'll wrap on this regarding, you know, what Ben mentioned and you had asked about ROI, uh, as well as Dylan had asked about ROI. You know, a lot of the times the way we look at it is simply it's just off balance sheet. And my background is largely in branding and marketing. So we look at goodwill and there's such an amazing amount of goodwill that you can have, you know, just not, not greenwashing, but actually doing, making the impact with nature-based solutions and then Property values go up. We've seen this. I don't, I don't have the data point, but it's it's a significant amount. It's probably in the ten percent or more range. Uh, property values can be elevated just by a function of just like there's there's green space or there's you know there's ivy walls or there's something organic uh, in that space. And so that's that's where you begin to see that that cert certainly a short or shorter term effect with property values and we see in CRE, but certainly the longer longer term effect and all the externalities and all the data layers you can put over these things as, as we look at you know, a lot of the importance of data and especially AI coming on board to say, all right, well, if you did this, how, how that might help this and then how that might help this. And so it, it all kind of works. And now we're talking about what? We're talking about diversity, which informs biodiversity. And uh, then back to you, because this is what we're really all focused on. We are biodiversity. We, we are nature. I'll leave us on that. Uh, so let's not let's not think about nature as something out there, something outside of us. That's where some of the challenges happen. Uh, let's not think about learning about nature. Let's start learning from nature. Nature is our mentor. Nature is wiser than we know, especially, especially in the collective intelligence of it all. So let's just remember we are nature. And so as such, we need nature. And we are, in fact, nature-based solutions. Amazing. What a way to, to finish things off. Um, thank you both. Um, uh, I'd just say uh, Ben Stapleton, Executive Director of uh, the US GBC in California. And uh, thank you, Colin Mangum from um, USB, US GBC California as well, Corporate Sustainability and Innovation uh, Director. Um, thank you to everyone that uh, attended. This was uh, my first time hosting a webinar, hopefully not the last. And uh, yeah, looking forward to um, connecting and, and um, have a nice afternoon. Thanks, everyone.